Welcome to the 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast, episode number 105. I'm your host, Rick Cole, and each week, right here on the Hockey Podcast Network, we take you on a trip down memory lane, back in time 50 years, where we learn about all the hockey news that was going on at that time, exactly as it was reported by some of the greatest sports writers of the era. In this episode, we're looking at the week of October 25th to 31st, 1971. Uh, Before we get started, we always like to remind people about our Patreon uh, page, patreon.com slash hockey50years. That's where you can go to subscribe to uh, this podcast. Now, what that gives you for your subscription fee at Patreon is early access to each week's show, plus some great special content that we're putting out, oh, several times a month where we take a deep dive into the subjects that were important during that time. We're going to have lots of news on the World Hockey Association, uh, a lot of stuff going around the the mess of the Detroit Red Wings, and other hockey stories that were important at the time. So so if you like what we do here, uh, go to patreon.com slash hockey50years, and you can help us out by subscribing. So this was a really busy news week around the hockey world 50 years ago. Lots of short, uh, quick hits. We're going to get to these things now uh, because there's just a lot, uh, a lot to get to. It was a very, very interesting week. We had a really tight race going on in the NHL's Eastern Division with the New York Rangers giving indications that they could be the class of the East this year. In the West, the week began with the Blackhawks holding only a three-point lead, definitely not running away with anything just yet. And the surprising second-place team was Red Kelly's Pittsburgh Penguins, but the Minnesota North Stars were looking good, and they would actually close the gap on the Blackhawks before the week was out. Uh, Pittsburgh had a kind of a nice problem at that time. About three goalkeepers, all NHL quality, in Les Binkley, Roy Edwards, who decided to come back after taking some time away to consider his future, and the youngster, Jimmy Rutherford, whom they'd acquired from the Red Wings. Well, the goal crease got a little less crowded in Pittsburgh this week as uh, uh, Rutherford suffered a rather unusual injury and he was carried off the ice on a stretcher, lying face down rather than the usual position of on his back. Tim Moriarty of Newsday described uh, the scene. Uh, He writes that strange things were happening all night in this game between the Penguins and the Rangers. Penguins starting goalie Jimmy Rutherford sustained a a weird injury with nine minutes left in the first period. He had made a great stick save on Rangers right winger Billy Fairburn, and then he just simply fell flat on his face in the crease. So they brought out the, the medical staff, they brought out a stretcher, they loaded him, face down onto the stretcher and carted him off the ice. It really didn't look good. But the diagnosis after x-rays, Jimmy had sustained strained muscles above his right ankle. You might call that a high ankle sprain, maybe. He apparently suffered the injury when he quickly turned to his right to stop Fairburn, uh, knowing the ice uh, that was going on in uh, New York at that time. He probably caught the goal skate in a rut. Now that leaves Roy Edwards and the ever-dependable Les Binkley to guard the goal for the Penguins for the foreseeable future, and we'll see if the Penguins can maintain the fine start they've had to the 71-72 season. A note out of Boston that might be an indication of the Bruins management's concern over the Boston team's very indifferent play so far this season. They're lacking something. There doesn't seem to be any urgency to their play. Uh, the only two guys who really look like they've got their heart in it are the goalies, Jerry Cheevers and Eddie Johnson. Well, Mike Walton, you remember Mike, they acquired him uh, from Philadelphia, or from the Leafs actually, by way of Philadelphia. Uh, 
in March of last season, January of last season, sorry. He normally plays left wing on the team's third line. Well, this week he found himself on the bench in favor of grinder winger Garnet Ace Bailey. And the word was that Mike Walton was running out of time to prove to coach Tom Johnson that Mike, that he, Mike, deserves regular work on that line. There were a lot of trade rumors surrounding the Bruins as well. Uh, they were going to be heading out west, we think, this week. There's a lot of, well, actually, they're already out in Vancouver, I guess. They, uh, there was a lot of uh, trade rumors and some speculation that the Bruins wanted to shake up their defensive core and bring in maybe some kind of a, uh, a disturbing type of forward for the forward line. Buffalo Sabres general manager Punch Imlach is well known for like his penchant for uh, liking to use uh, veteran players on his teams. He won four Stanley Cups in Toronto by depending on well-worn veterans who might have had a little mileage left on the tires. But he looks like he may not be taking the same route as he builds his expansion Buffalo Sabres now in their second year in the NHL. Uh, Punch has a couple of very uh, good veterans, several very good veterans on the team, including two that helped them win Stanley Cups in Toronto, namely left wingers Dickie Duff and all over the place winger Eddie Shack. Uh, well, this week the Sabres left for their West Coast swing and assistant general manager Fred Hunt says, we're taking 19 players with us and we're taking the 19 players we figure will help the club most. And surprisingly, that meant that Dick Duff and Eddie Shack, plus young defenseman Mike Robitaille, who's not completely healthy at the moment, let, were left behind in Buffalo to work out on their own. And it seems that neither Duff nor Shack might be long for the Sabres. I report on this story mainly because I, I followed this guy's career for quite a while. Uh, being from the area of Dunville, Ontario, that's where I went to high school. Frank Gianelli of the Arizona Republic reports on Doug Dunville, an often troubled de defenseman, and his battles with the bottle had almost scuttled a promising career. Well, dried out and doing great is the word on Doug Dunville, uh, for uh, who used to play for... Uh, Phoenix and Vancouver in the Western League. He was in the Maple Leafs organization. His blithe spirit and alignment with John Barleycorn sent his career as a hockey player into a tailspin. But Bud Poyle, the Vancouver Canucks general manager, reports that it's been 200 days since Dougie sipped anything stronger than iced tea. Doug's wife is uh, allied with him in an uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous program in Rochester where he's playing for the Americans and you know what people are starting to say if Doug can continue on this path he might yet have a long and successful career in the NHL he's a very talented guy and when he has his head on straight he's a darn good hockey player the National Hockey League desperately, desperately wants the uh, Seals to succeed in California one way or another. They've been doing everything they can, the league that is, to try and ensure success for that franchise. But the one thing they, they haven't done, they haven't ensured success by making sure the team had good owners. They had opportunities when the expansion franchise was first awarded, but instead of giving it to groups that probably had the best interest of the Bay Area at heart and knew how to run hockey franchises, they awarded the franchise to a some guy named Baron Van Gerbig, who was a tennis buddy of Bill Jennings, chair of the National Hockey League's expansion committee in 1967. Well, here's how the NHL tried to help the Seals this season. Of course, trying to help present owner Charles O. Finley as well. It was a rather surreptitious way of doing it. They didn't uh, draw any attention to this. But what they did this season is they jockeyed the National Hockey League schedule so that the California Golden Seals would play their first seven games of the season at home, virtually guaranteeing the team a good start to the season. But the guess what? The hockey players apparently didn't get the memo. They won exactly none 
of those first seven games in that homestand. And by the end of the homestand, the Oakland Seals, California Golden Seals, whatever they're calling them this week, those guys couldn't wait to get out on the road. An American Hockey League game in Rochester was canceled last week, and it was by a strike by ushers and ticket takers, and you'll never guess the reasons for the job action. Well, it turns out that the staff of the Rochester War Memorial Arena, who, by the way, were working without a contract with the hockey team since September 1st, walked off the job because the team had announced it was going to hire at least four women to perform the same duties as the men, as male uh, the male ushers. In other words, they were going to hire usherettes, and the completely 100% male union members says they did not want this to happen this was a male only bastion and women were not welcome so they walked off the job the Merck said they are hiring women where they like it or not and none of the men were going to lose either their jobs or any money by this hiring The Montreal Canadiens were running into some early season health issues this year. Uh, they were going to be this week without Peter Mahovlich, who had a respiratory infection. Mark Tardif with a swollen foot, he blocked the shot. And Terry Harper's back was acting up. So they called up three rookies from the Nova Scotia Voyagers to have a look with the Habs to see if they're ready. But these were some pretty young guys. Uh, two first-year pros were called up from the Voyagers. Defenseman Bob Bob Murray, he's out of Michigan Tech in the States, and left winger Murray Wilson, who's in his first professional season out of the Oshawa 67s of the OHA Junior A Series. A second year pro will also play with the Canadians this week, and he is winger Chuck Lefley, who was a very high scoring player in the uh, Western Canada Junior League before he was drafted by Montreal, and he was with Nova Scotia. Well, actually, it was the Montreal Voyage last year and now Nova Scotia this season. Well, the NHL Board of Governors had that meeting they were going to have to discuss expansion, allegedly, at Homososa, and I hope I said that right, Florida, where they were expected to uh, talk about how or if they were going to expand, but no one would admit it. That the session was really a strategy planning exercise as the governors dealt with the prospect of an all-out war with the upstart World Hockey Association. The outcome of the meeting wasn't immediately known as all the participants were pretty tight-lipped over the content of the discussions. Canadian press had this little blurb on it. They said a formal plan for the next stage of the National Hockey League expansion will finally be presented on November. November 8th in New York. The league's board of governors apparently made the decision at the meetings in Florida. Vice President of the National Hockey League, Donald Ruck, said that the governors gave lengthy attention to further expansion from the current 14 teams and that a study group was set up to prepare a formal plan for review and consideration of the entire board at that November meeting. All the clubs were represented at the Florida meeting, which began 4 p.m. on Monday of this week we're talking about, and lasted all day Tuesday, and then convened again at 8 a.m. sharp on Wednesday uh, to clean up of what apparently was a very heavy agenda. The only official announcement coming out of the closed sessions concerned further growth of the league which until 1967 of course as we all know had only six clubs well actually there were more clubs off and on before 1967 so don't this is where they started talking about the original six the original six make no mistake were not the original six they were the pre-expansion six Well, we talk about the structure of the National Hockey League. There are whispers about the Ontario Hockey Association Junior A Series undergoing some changes as well. But this seems to happen every other year or so. Now they're talking again in Quebec that the Montreal Junior Canadians will switch from the OHA back to the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League for next season. Of course, The reason for this is not the better competition that the OHA offers. 
It's money. That's what's behind this idea. The baby habs uh, are said, and actually they're not, the attendance figures short, they're not drawing as well at the forum as they had in previous years. And it's thought that teams like the Quebec Remparts would be a better draw at Montreal. The problem is not the, the uh, OHA or having more Quebec teams in as much as it is having good players. You had Gilbert Perrault in Montreal. You had Richard Martin in Montreal. Jocelyn Gavermont. Now the Montreal Junior Canadiens don't have that star quality. You're also not going to have a great team out of Quebec where their big attraction, Guy Lafleur, is now playing for the Habs and drawing fans there. Former Canadian national team star Fran Huck, now with the St. Louis Blues organization, found himself put on waivers this week. Fran had asked for a trade like he did when he was in Montreal and he couldn't make the team. And he said he wants, he believes, he's an NHL player. So the Blues accommodated him. They put Fran on waivers for $30,000. Any team in the NHL could claim him. Well, he cleared waivers, and he's now going to the Denver Spurs of the Western Hockey League. But you know what? They put a very good team together out there in Colorado and Denver. It's very impressive. They have a chance to win a Western Hockey League championship, a lot of people believe. Well, here's uh, an interesting news item as uh, folks in the NHL attempt to... uh, cut down on fighting. The Cincinnati Swords have had a very successful start to the American Hockey League season, their first AHL season, and general manager coach Joe Crozier is out to add a little more punch to what he considers a rather genteel squad. Joe Crozier told a news conference in Halifax that he plans to install a punching bag in the dressing room for both home and road games, and also that Joe has hired the United States Olympic boxing coach, Roly Schwartz, uh, to teach his players to, quote, look after themselves. Speaking before a game this week with the Nova Scotia Voyageurs, Crozier said he's fed up with other American Hockey League teams take advantage of his smallish hockey club. The Swords and the Voyageurs were involved in two free springing swinging brawls during uh, the contest on the weekend at the Halifax Forum. So Crozier says we're going to have 10 days under our belts before we meet the Voyageurs in Cincinnati and by that time we should be ready for those big lumberjacks you Nova Scotians have on your team. So Swartz is scheduled to begin boxing lessons when the Swords return to Cincinnati this week. Crozier maintains that the self-defense program is no publicity stunt. He says that the team must learn to defend themselves or else they'll not be around by Christmas because of the lumberjacks kicking the hell out of us. Joe Crozier, one of the old school guys in 1971. It seems that there's a lot of angst in Montreal in this very young National Hockey League season that Guy Lafleur, the first draft pick, the much ballyhooed junior coming out of the Quebec Remparts, it seems, according to a lot of people in Montreal, that he's just not everything he's been cracked up to be. Of course, he's only in his first month of pro hockey. It's quite an adjustment. But, you know, the pressures that they put on hockey players in uh, Montreal, just as bad as Toronto. Well, this week, Montreal coach Scotty Bowman took uh, Guy out of the center slot on the first line where he was being uh, worked between Ivan Cournoyer and Frank Mahovlich, and he moved him to right wing on the team's third line with a couple of fellows by the name of Larry Plo and Rajon Uhl. So we'll see how this works out. Uh, This Lafleur kid has oodles and oodles of potential. And really, they need to let him get his feet wet to get a a good grounding in the NHL before they start bouncing him around, and especially before the fans and the press start hounding him the way they do in Montreal. Well, the Penguins' Brian Watson is up to his old tricks uh, in a game versus the Flyers recently. And what's interesting is that Bugsy Watson doesn't deny his annex. 
He's always been a, a stand-up guy. Well, here's a story that has to do with Bugsy Watson this week. Now, much was made in the Philadelphia newspapers and the hockey news, a, a weekly, of an incident that took place during a game between the Penguins and the Flyers. Watson was named the culprit of a bloody unpleasantness in which rookie right-winger of the Flyers, Pierre Plant, was basically decked. Now, the stories vary depending on members of which team to whom you speak. In Philadelphia, they say Watson jumped out of the Penguins' bench and nailed 19-year-old Plant with a stick somewhere in the head. The way Watson explains it's this way. This kid used an elbow to nail Les Binkley, the goalie, and knocked him down. And while he was stunned, Bobby Clark followed through and scored a goal. So Watson says, while the Philadelphia players were congratulating Plant and Clark, he got to him first and punched him right in the face and knocked him down. Watson says, I got a game misconduct penalty out of it. He was knocked out of the game, though, for the night, so I guess it was worth it. Plant, the Philly Papers noted, is looking forward to the December 26th game, the rematch between the two clubs, where he says he's going to settle his score with Watson for the bloody nose that he suffered. But you know what? Brian Watson will be ready. You can bet on that. Well, if you've been following us, you know we've reported a lot over the past few months on the financial woes of Medicor, the United States-based company that owns the Vancouver Canucks. Their uh, monetary problems are legendary, and there was a little bit more thanks to Hal Sigurdsson of the Vancouver Sun and this report this week. Uh, Hal writes that for the men from Medicor, the situation is basically unchanged, but within a matter of hours, they could be back in debt to a different money lender. If the deal goes through, Hotel Man Coley Hall, who was a director of Northwest Sports, the parent company of, of the NHL Canucks, he will emerge as the man in control of the purse strings. This is possible. Hall told the Vancouver Sun Wednesday night that he has agreed to lend Medicor $3.8 million at an interest rate of 10.5%. Now, Medicor holds a 60% interest in Northwest Sports. Their loan, well, we'll try and explain it here. Uh, Sigurdsson will write it. The Hall loan would allow Medicor to pay off the balance of a $3.65 million loan to Kapazi Enterprises Limited, a private company in Vancouver uh, wholly owned by the by that Kapazi family. Uh, and also... They're, they're also have business interest, by the way, in the town of Kelowna. Interest on the Kapazi loan is 18%. Talk about loan sharking. Eh? That's a, a lot. So Coley Hall says, hey, I'll pay off your loan. You only got to pay me 10 and a half. Now, Hall said his proposal is still subject to a few conditions. Uh, he says it's a matter of properly securing the loan. The only collateral I'm interested in is Medicare's share in Northwest Sports. Of course it is. Coley was part of the... Uh, conglomerates that tried to get the Vancouver uh, city of Vancouver into the NHL in 1967. Now he says that for this loan to be administered, uh, Medicor will have to guarantee there will be no claims on those shares from outside the country of Canada. If that condition is not met within 48 hours of the offer being made, there won't be any Loan. So Coley Hall said that Medicare president Tom Scallon, you've heard that name often, he said he was confident that he could meet the required condition. If he can, he will repay the Kapazis, but the family will still retain a preferred position in an option in the event the hockey club is ever sold. The option, which runs 10 years by the way, allows the Kapazi family to buy the club for 15% less than the best outside offer. That's how desperate Medicor was to get the loan that they gave them this kind of a, an option on buying the club. If the Hall uh, loan goes through, 
It will be a one-year deal with an unspecified number of renewal options. But after one year, the outstanding balance can be called in on demand, which means all of a sudden the uh, Coley Hall conglomerate, if you want to call it that, could end up with control of the Canucks. And if Hall puts up the money, Hall will call the shots in the operation of the Canucks, at least indirectly, until the loan is repaid. We'll control the board of directors, Coley said. There will be three Vancouver directors and then only two from Medicor. Hall said he wouldn't be putting up the entire $3.8 million personally, but he added, I am the principal in this deal. Well, we'll see what happens with the Canucks and whether they finally get fully Canadian ownership. Hey, NFL fans, hungry for a big win this week? DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the National Football League, has you covered. New customers can bet just $5 on any NFL team to win their game, and if they do, you win $200 in free bets. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, it's that simple. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, DraftKings won't leave you empty-handed. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes all season long with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports Contest. DraftKings has given all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code TH. PN bet just five dollars on any NFL team to win their game and you win two hundred dollars in free bets. If they win, you win with promo code THPN this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. You must be 21 or older in New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers are only eligible for this. You require a minimum $5 deposit and a $1 wager. One per customer. Restrictions do apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for all the details. Got a gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Well, Derek Sanderson's mouth got him in some hot water this week. Uh, There were some quotes in the Montreal Gazette that weren't too complimentary towards Boston Bruins fans, believe it or not. Tom Fitzgerald of the Boston Globe reports, Derek Sanderson was somewhat stunned and maybe a little contrite in reaction to the furor that was set off by his latest adventure in candor. Still coughing and rather drawn looking from the game with the Canadians, a controversial hockey player revised some of the free willing opinions set forth in an interview published in the Montreal Gazette. Sanderson said, I was feeling lousy and down on just about everything, including myself. Sanderson said he was talking to newspaper guy Tim Burke, just kind of rapping, and and Burke didn't take any notes at all. He just uh, listened, and some of the stuff actually sounded worse than Derek intended. One point that particularly concerned Sanderson was a quote about the Boston hockey fans. The quote said, if you're not ahead by 9-1 by the end of the first period, then they're booing you. They're expecting too much from us. Sanderson claims that this uh, statement was muchly exaggerated. Derek was quick to point out, I don't think that way about most of our fans. Boston fans have been really, really good to me. I was talking about the small percentage of loud ones who hand out all the criticism, which I think is very, very unfair. I don't know how the idea come out on what I was saying about that. My home really is in the United States and I love it there. And I love the fans. The country has been good to me and and has given me such a great living. Uh, There was talk that Derek was, when he played Montreal, glad to be back in Canada. I'm a Canadian and I'm going to stay in, uh, in Canada. I'm going to stay Canadian. That's what he had said. And a lot of people took exception to that as well. Uh, Sanderson pointed out uh, that he has been looking forward to taking out his American citizenship papers. But then Derek goes on to say, what I'd really like to do is to buy some land out in Alberta and start a commune, raise some quarter horses, 
and try to help the Indians. We're talking about the uh, Canadian Indigenous people. In 1971, they still said Indians. Nobody else is doing very much for them. And I, and I applaud them for that because that was very true. And 50 years later, it's still true. Derek says, I've been dreaming about some things like that. I'm not going to do it right away, though, to tell you the truth. I feel so rotten right now. I really don't know what to do. I don't know really what it is. I have to wonder if I might have mono. I just feel so damn tired all the time. The Toronto Maple Leaf defensemen and goalkeepers got together for a lunch this week, a cozy sort of tete-a-tete, uh, mainly for the good of the team. The goalkeepers might suggest it was one of the few times that the defensemen have got together with them at all this season, but after Wednesday's very satisfactory nothing-nothing tie with the Vancouver Canucks, uh, such a remark couldn't be considered appropriate. The defense was absolutely spectacular in that game for the Maple Leafs. Bobby Bonn organized the luncheon, but said emphatically that he hadn't called it as the elder statesman of the defense. It's Bobby said it's just a get-together, a chance for us to talk over a few beers. We don't get the chance to do this very often. The defenseman met occasionally last season as well after Bonn arrived and initiated the idea. What we talk about depends on how we've been playing, said Rick Lee. Of course, there's not much reason for me to be there at all. I haven't been playing. Rick's been out of the Maple Leaf lineman for quite a while because of a knee injury. But he did say we don't just talk about hockey or the way we're playing. Sometimes you accomplish a lot just by not saying anything. Jim Dory says it's a chance for us to get together uh, Dory thinks uh, defensemen are different from forwards, and of course they're way different than goalkeepers, but then goalkeepers are different than anyone else. He just says that uh, it's just a, a chance to get together and kind of talk things over, and we think that's good for the team. Milt Dunnell of the Toronto Star this week had an interesting bit uh, from Al Eagleson in the NHLPA reaction to the World Hockey Association. The uh, reaction of the uh, association is one of cordial and cautious welcome. Al Eagleson is talking to every team in the NHL. His advice on the issue is be careful what you do. Be careful about the position in which you put yourself. To be more specific, Eagleson is not as sure as the WHA promoters profess to be that an NHL player is a free agent when his current contract runs out. Now, Eagleson doubts that the so-called reserve clause would be upheld in court, but he freely admits that he doesn't know because it hasn't been tested. Now, Eagleson professes to not want to see a member of the association sidelined because his NHL employer has an injunction against him for jumping. So really, what Eagleson is kind of saying is be careful about this WHA. This was one of our early clues that Al Eagleson may have been a lot closer to the governors of the NHL and was thinking of their well-being as well as the well-being of their players. Now, if the new owners of the WHA have designs on Bobby Orr, Eagleson says they got to wait five years. We bargained on a five-year basis with Boston, and that contract will be valid for that amount of time. Eagleson also says Orr always lives up to his contracts. Another of the big names is Phil Esposito, and of course, he's also on a long-term uh, contract to Boston. Eagleson says he feels the threat of a new league has already helped the players. The NHL owners have removed the unpopular clause number 13C from the standard contracts. That clause allowed an NHL team to cut a player loose without further pay on just two weeks notice. In Buffalo, they call him both Rick Martin and Richard Martin. So what's correct with the Buffalo Sabres sharpshooting rookie? Well, we have the goods for you right here. Dave Shadia, Richard Martin's legal representative, says you can pronounce a Buffalo Sabres hotshot's name either way. Shadia says Rick's father is English, his mother is French, and he's from LaSalle. 
Uh, Shacha says he speaks to his father in English. He talks with his mother in French. His French friends use the French pronunciation, Richard, and the English friends use the other. As far as Rick's concerned, it doesn't matter to him how you say his name. So there you go. Rick Martin, Richard Martin, whatever you like. Young Jules Melosh, the goalie that the Seals acquired from the Blackhawks to rework that awful Jerry Desjardins, Gary Smith mess, that trade between the Seals and the Blackhawks, he made his debut with California on Thursday night of this week, and all the kid did was go right into Boston Garden and blank the Bruins 2 to nothing, making 34 saves in the process. Even crusty old coach Vic Stasiuk, the new Seals coach, by the way, skittered onto the ice at the end of the game, gingerly walked across the slippery surface, and planted a kiss right on Malasha's goal mask. Malasha, of course, was mobbed by his mates, and all the California Seals are saying the next great goaltender has arrived in the NHL. Well, that World Hockey Association meeting, by the way, is taking place this weekend in New York. And uh, we're wondering, will Edmonton, Calgary be two new Winnipeg as well? Three new uh, Canadian teams that have uh, major pro hockey? Well, we'll see. Bill Hunter, the majority owner and general manager of the Western Canada Hockey League Edmonton Oil Kings Junior A team, he heads the group which holds the option for the WHA franchise for the city. Remember, the franchises have not yet officially been granted, so we're told. Hunter says, we are exercising our option. We will be in the World Hockey Association. Edmonton Journal columnist Wayne Overland is going to attend the WHA meeting and he'll be giving us reports on uh, the composition, the owners, the rules, regulations, schedules, and player possibilities for the new league and he'll attempt to assess the new league's chances of surviving a war with the NHL And we will have all those details for them, for you. Uh, We'll have some of the headlines of it next week in our regular show and our overtime sessions, which you can get as a Patreon subscriber. We'll go into great detail on these announcements. One of the proposed WHA teams actually jumped the gun on Saturday. The formation of the Chicago Cougars, including for plans for a $20 million stadium in time for the start of the WHA season in 72-73, was announced on actually Friday and Saturday of of the week. Last week, the WHA disclosed it would compete against the NHL without the benefit of a a revert reserved clause. A. John Syke, president of Chicago Hockey Incorporated, that's the company that will operate the WHA Cougars, uh, he said that the WHA estimates that within two seasons it will match the caliber of the NHL's recent expansion team. The World Hockey Association, which is to hold a formal organization meeting in New York on Monday, expects each member club to have five players somehow obtained from the NHL on its 20-man rosters. And uh, Syke is very uh, optimistic that he can get five good NHL players on his team. He, by the way, is an official of an ice rink in suburban Oak Brook, Illinois. Syke said, we don't envision raiding the NHL, but we know all the NHL players are anxious for the formation of this new league. Now, the story says that franchises have been granted to uh, cities such as New York, Miami, et cetera, et cetera. But officially, Gary Davidson said, there have no been franchises granted options on whether they want to follow through with these franchises will be uh, followed up and made official one way or the other on Monday. I'm a a self-confessed media junkie. I have been since an early age when I was completely mesmerized by Walter Cronkite, 11 years old, 1962. His reporting on the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, hooked me on the news. And uh, since that time, the people who reported the news, it was just something I I wanted to be involved in, in broadcasting. I did. It took me a while. I had a very circuitous... uh, Path before I got into doing the podcasting now, but 
here we are. Well, one of the big deals for me in 1971 was the burning question of who would replace Ward Cornell as intermission host on the Toronto production of Hockey Night in Canada every Saturday night. And this week, we got our answer. 26-year-old Dave Hodge of Toronto was the newest member of the Hockey Night in Canada team. He joined the Toronto on-camera crew as an 11th hour edition following a series of auditions held to locate his successor for Ward Cornell. Dave won the job over a large and rather impressive group of hopefuls that showed up to try and get the position. Uh, the uh, CTV announcement here does not mention who the uh, hopefuls were that wanted to get the job. Now Dave Hodge was born in Montreal. He spent the first five years of his life there and the next five years in Winnipeg but since then he's called Toronto home since they moved there in 1955. Despite three years in Chatham, Ontario that they spent uh, with where his dad worked there. Uh, Dave spent 1966 as a member of the Chatham Daily News sports staff and then he moved to CFCO Chatham the next two years as sports editor and currently he's in his fourth year at CFRB in Toronto which of course is the um, News Talk 1010 I believe 50 years later. Well we've been nearly a month into the NHL season and guess what? The coaches are starting to fall already. The Los Angeles Kings, mired in last place in the Western Division of the NHL, fired, uh, well actually didn't fire, they removed General Manager Larry Regan as coach. He retains his position as General Manager, however, and Larry went out and hired as his replacement, Freddie Glover, who just a couple weeks ago was fired as coach of the California Golden Seals. Glover, 43, had just started his fourth season as a Seals coach, and then after three games, they booted him out of the organization. The Kings owner, Jack Kent Cook, said before the season began, Larry suggested that he couldn't do justice to both jobs as coach and general manager, and I urged him to give it a try. That's what Cook said. He wanted Larry. Of course he did. He was saving money. He doesn't have to pay a coach. I wonder if he's going to dock Larry's salary now that he's not doing two jobs. Now, Jack Kent Cook says, I am now convinced that the dual job is too big for one man. So Freddie Glover takes over the Kings and it's got to be better than what's been going on there. And a very similar move was made in St. Louis. Now, St. Louis has never been the same since Scotty Bowman bid farewell after last season. And, of course, they brought in uh, Sid Abel to take over behind the bench of the Blues this year. Well, this week, Sid Abel was named general manager of the Blues, but he will not remain as coach. Apparently, this version of Sid coaching in St. Louis was a disaster. They needed to get him out of there. So Bill McCreary was named to replace Abel as the coach of the Blues, who were 3-3 three and three thus far this season. 35-year-old McCreary played for the Blues from 1967 to 70, and he was named this year to coach the Blues farm team, the Denver Spurs, in the Western Hockey League. Now, I told you earlier they have a good team in Denver. They have a 5-1 record this year. Now, this change also involved Lynn Patrick, the Blues vice president, who's been function functioning as general manager since Scotty Bowman left in the summer. He remains with the Blues as vice president. Abel resigned as general manager of the Detroit Red Wings during last season, was later hired as a replacement for Scotty Bowman, as we've been telling you that. The announcement was made just before the start of the St. Louis-Philadelphia hockey game this week, and uh, McCurry was on hand to uh, help the Blues to try and win in his first game. It was going to be a little tougher than, than uh, Bill would think it was going to be. Stay tuned for more development out of St. Louis this season. We probably mentioned to you about Junior A hockey player for St. Catherine's Blackhawks, Mike Bloom, is uh, ha facing charges of assaulting a Quebec uh, police officer. Canadian Press reported this week that uh, 
Bloom appeared in court and he pled not guilty to a charge of striking a policeman after a hockey game. No sooner did Sessions Court Judge Louis Fortam release Bloom on $950 bail, setting his trial date for December 15th, by the way, than did his lawyer Guy Bertrand withdraw from the case, charging political intervention. Mr. Bertrand recalled later that Bloom, an Ottawa product, was to have appeared last Monday, but the appearance was postponed because the defense had not received a copy of the judgment of Mr. Justice Frederick Dorian of Superior Court, who had been asked to refer the case to a higher court. Mr. Bertrand had sought a writ of soteriori against Session Court Judge Yvonne Sirwa, contending that the judge has exceeded his authority in the case. Mr. Bertrand had asked Judge Sirwa last June to drop the charges against Bloom because the summons issued against him was in French and it lacked necessary details to inform his client exactly what the charges consisted of. But he said the judge refused the request while ordering the summons to be translated. Judge Dorian subsequently rejected the request and said Judge Sirwa did not exceed his authority and acted wisely in refusing the demand that the charges be dropped. Meanwhile, Bloom's counsel is now lawyer Roger Valeri of Ottawa and he will now take the case from there. One more quick note on the WHA. They're popping up everywhere these days. And this happened just before the end of the week. And somebody uh, in the Associated Press got this out of out of Gary Davidson just before the week came to an end. That a couple of cities were, have already told them they're going to exercise their options that I spoke about earlier to join the WHA. Uh, they include the city of San Francisco and apparently 10 other cities. Uh, they would include New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, Dayton, Ohio, St. Paul, Minnesota, and the three Canadian cities of Winnipeg, Calgary, and Edmonton. So those are the teams that are apparently going to be there. We'll have more next week. But there are some other cities that Davidson said they're thinking of. And they include Atlanta, a team in the Carolinas, somewhere in Kentucky, Indiana, a, a team in New England, a team in New Jersey, and maybe another team in Canada and Ontario. We'll talk about that next week. So that's this week's show, everyone. We kind of moved through things very quickly here because there was just a lot of news coming in. We try and bring it to you in a chronological uh, order, and that's why we had the... Uh, the WTA stories popping up through. It was coming out all through the week. And that last story, just uh, as uh, papers were coming out uh, on Sunday. Uh, so what did we learn this week? Well, we had more coaching changes in the NHL. Kings and Blues made switches behind the bench. Uh, we saw newly acquired goalie young Joe Malosh made quite a debut with the California Seals and shutting out the Boston Bruins. And we got some news as we mentioned, on progress being made by the WHA. Uh, and we're starting to learn where new teams are being located. Next week is going to be a significant week in the, uh, uh, I guess, the evolution of the new Hockey League. So next week's show, like I said, more news on the WHA, including possibly details on a team in Hamilton, Ontario. There's going to be more turmoil in Detroit next week. Ned Harkness is running a fine show there, isn't he? And next week, the Montreal Canadiens are finally going to trade away a goalie. We'll tell you who he is and where he's going. The 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast is produced by Andy Cole. Can't thank him enough for everything he does. Uh, true media professional Andy is. He's uh, here in Ontario with us right now, and it's really helping us out here. He's improved my setup here. We'll probably post a picture on Twitter one of these days on how the uh, podcasting setup is working now. It's really helping me a lot. Andy also produces podcasts professionally. If you want to start one up, get hold of me. I'll hook you up with Andy. He's one of the best in the business. The very popular Juno-nominated Toronto Indy Rock Group, the Rural Alberta Advantage, provides our introduction and exit music. If you ever get a chance to see him perform live, they put on a great high-energy show. I understand they may be doing a show in Alberta in November, but 
that still may be up in the air. We're not sure about that yet. Uh, other musical pieces in the show and sound effects are all created by Andy Cole. Our research comes from files of the Toronto Star, Toronto Globe and Mail, and of course, the many publications found at newspapers.com. You can find us on Twitter every day at at hockey 50 years we're on facebook under the 50 years ago on hockey banner our wordpress site is hockey 50 years ago.com and you can get this podcast every week on the hockey podcast network or wherever you download your favorite podcasts don't forget our patreon page patreon.com slash hockey 50 years thanks again to everyone who tunes in every week uh, this 71 72 season is is proving to be a critical one in the history of the nhl we'll be with you all the way and we hope you'll be with us too and on that note we will see you next time when the-